of the Christian powers. Last week I talked about choices, actions, and words. If you actually think about the choices and action and words that we have, I mean, just think about all the things in the world. The way Satan gets to you and the way Satan gets to others is through another person's choices, actions, and words. Now, he might use circumstances, but it's always going to have a human element of influence there. This is the way Satan works on us and the way he works on others. Today, I'm going to be looking at awakening your dormant spiritual gifts. And I'm, I'm going to explain this title to you because many people know that you have some sort of talent and skill, but you didn't know that it was actually intended to be a spiritual gift and it lies dormant. Why is it dormant and how can we reawaken it? And let me ask you this question. How many of you actually have done a spiritual gifts assessment or inventory? Anyone have done an official one? Okay, about 10 of us here. Today at 2 o'clock, if you're interested to know what your spiritual gift is, I'm going to encourage you to come at 2 o'clock. I'm going to start right on time. We're going to broadcast live for people watching. And we're going to, I'm going to take you through a process that will determine what God has given you and why that's important. And, we, and within an hour, you will know what your spiritual gift is and then how you can use that, okay? So we're going to be looking at awakening your dormant spiritual gifts um, and then this afternoon, determining your spiritual gifts. Now, let's go back in time. The Christian age started after Jesus left with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. When the day of Pentecost came, there were people from all over the world that were in Jerusalem for the Passover, and that's when the Pentecost came. And as many of you read, the Holy Spirit descended on those believers in the form of fire. And it hovered over them, and they began to do incredible things that they've never seen before. They were speaking in tongues. Now, the disciples had the gift of healing because God gave them that authority, but this is the first time they were able to see a manifestation of spiritual gifts in the church itself without Jesus present. Jesus was gone, and now all of a sudden, this new movement is getting a, a, a gift of something that they've never seen before. And people were so amazed that they started to write it down. In fact, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, through the Apostle Paul, that there were so many manifested gifts given to, to the church that it would profit everyone. It would profit all. Now, one of the things I did want to mention here is that when Paul was talking about the great variety of spiritual gifts that were manifested among the believers in that primitive church, the, the manifestation of the gifts were for the benefit of those in the church, not the world. In the church, not the world. As many today have applied it. They believe, many people are saying, that the spiritual gifts were meant to be gifted to the whole world, and that's not true. The spiritual gifts were meant for those who have accepted Jesus as their personal Savior and have come into the body of Jesus Christ. Now, since the great apostasy in the church, since the time when the church developed and evolved to the point where truth was no longer being taught, it seems as if these spiritual gifts have rarely been seen. In other words, they were suppressed. And for this reason, today, many Christians generally believe that the amazing gifts that we've seen in the book of Acts were limited to the period of the primitive church. That they believe what we saw written there by the disciples is something that we won't see ever again. But since the special work of the Holy Spirit was necessary to prepare a people for the first advent of Christ, how much more so for the second advent of Christ? Which means that we will see a resurgence of something miraculous within the church itself. The last days will be more perilous than the past. If you think being fed to the lions and being burned at the stake and being persecuted and being crucified and having your head decapitated was horrible, Jesus says that in the last days, the time of trouble will be even more perilous than what we have seen in history. And it'll be beyond all precedent. In other words, the evil that can come into the hearts and minds of man have not even come to the saturation point. There is more evil that has still yet to be seen. And the object of Satan's attack will be on God's people. We will see the rise of false prophets. 
And these false prophets will even be able to show such great signs and great wonders and miracles that even if it were possible, you, the very elect, those of you who study God's word, those of you who pray every day could actually be deceived. Now that's serious when you think about it because that's going to be something convincing. Satan will be very convincing in the last days, but it is prophesied that in these last days, when the people of God retain and reattain their primitive faith, when they reattain the primitive practice of the early church, who get together as family units, get together as brothers and sisters in Christ, and when they begin to pray and they begin to proclaim the commandments of God, when they begin to own the faith of Jesus as their very own, then there will be a latter rain. There will be a latter rain of spiritual gifts and it will pour like the church has never seen before. Joel chapter 2 verse 23 tells us, Be glad then, you children of Zion. You are the children of Zion. You are spiritual Israel. God is telling you to be glad, be joyful today. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain faithfully. He's talking about the day of Pentecost. If you saw the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and evidence of the day of Pentecost, he says that he will cause rain to come down for you. The former rain will be in the form of the latter rain in the first month. The first month of when? It is the countdown to the end. We are in that first month now. I started out this morning by giving you some horrible news of what's happening in the Supreme Court of the United States. Brothers and sisters, mark my words. We are now on the final march and countdown to the fulfillment of Revelation 13. It is time now for God's people to wake up, discover your spiritual gifts, awaken your dormant energies, and let's finish this work and let's go home. Joel goes on and tells us, and it shall come to pass afterwards in these last days, I will pour out my Holy Spirit on all flesh. In other words, your sons, your daughters will begin to prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. So don't disregard when the youth are beginning to rise up and say, we have to go back and see what God has for us. Because revelation of prophecy is always progressive. We might think we know the truth, but God is still have something yet to reveal to us in the future. And it's going to come through the voices of the young people. It's going to come through the voices of the old men. It's going to be from the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that the latter rain will begin to come upon us. It tells us, and also on my men servant and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. What days is he talking about? Our day today. The Holy Spirit is not gone. It may have been there in the primitive church. It may have been suppressed by Satan through the dark ages. But let me tell you, the last days will see an outpouring of the latter rain. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord. Do you notice that? In other words, he's not saying those who are Seventh-day Adventists, those who are Mormon, those who are Jehovah's Witness. He didn't say that. It didn't say, those who call my name by Christianity. It doesn't say that. You can be Muslim, you can be Hindu, you can be Buddhist. But God says in the last days, those who call on the name of the Lord will find salvation. There's power in the name of Jesus. And salvation is not limited to Christians. Salvation is for all mankind. Thus saith the Lord. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, are we talking about the real Mount Zion? Are we talking about the real Jerusalem? Are we talking about God's people collectively before he comes again? We are Mount Zion. We are Jerusalem, the city of peace. There shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant, the small few in the last days, whom the Lord has called out to complete his work. The latter rain will come. It will come on a remnant. And people will come from around the world to find salvation under the shadow of the Almighty. And you who are the royal priesthood will usher them in through the gates of the city of Zion. The Bible tells us 
that Satan is not going to be happy. Satan is going to seek and do everything he can, he can to resuppress the spiritual gifts. He knows that his time is very short. He will try to rob you and he'll use others to rob you. So I'm going to tell you something. Do not let anyone, including do not allow yourself to take your focus off of Jesus or suppress your spiritual gift. Because there are only two influences in your life. People around you that Satan can use or your own mind as you look into the mirror. Do not let yourself or do not let others rob you of the gift that God has given you. Now, I'm going to give you something. This is very important. This is a very important secret number one. Here's what Satan's going to do. Okay? Mark my words. If Satan can lead you in your discouragement that he provides you every day, in your discouragement, if he can lead you in your discouragement to take your eyes off of Jesus just for a moment, like he did with Peter as he was walking on water, allow Satan to take your focus just for a second off of Jesus, if he can get you to look at yourself, number three, if he can get you to dwell on your own unworthiness, I'm not good enough, I didn't sing good enough, I'm not perfect enough, I'm not praying good enough, I'm sitting here, I'm so tired, I keep saying horrible things to my family, I'm always bitter all the time. If Satan can get you to focus on your unworthiness, and number four, take your focus away from the worthiness of Jesus, take your focus away from the love of God, if Satan can for a moment take your focus away from God's merit on your behalf, and if he can take your focus of his great mercy that he has for you, if Satan can do all of these things, guess what's going to happen? Satan will suppress your spiritual gift. He will weaken your armor, which we'll talk about next week. And most of all, he will allow you to be exposed to his fiery temptations. Now notice all he had to do was take your focus off of Jesus and put your focus on yourself. As soon as Satan can do that, you are doomed. You are doomed. Therefore, if you feel weak in this regard, then I ask you to just do one simple thing. Take your focus and refocus and look back at Jesus. That's all you have to do. Don't worry about singing a song horrible. Don't worry about not doing things perfectly. You just have to get your focus back on Jesus and his grace, on his merit, on his love, on his worthiness. Get your focus, put it back on Jesus. Believe in what he's going to do for you and exercise faith in God's amazing grace. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. Why is it so sweet? You know I love mangoes. Mangoes are sweet. Amazing Grace is like a Filipino mango. Okay? It is sweet. It touches me at a, at a very guttural place in my stomach. Amazing Grace in Christ has to be just like that. Taste the sweetness of Amazing Grace. Because I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. My sight only saw things when the light of God shined into the darkness. When I'm not looking at Jesus, I'm looking in darkness. And guess what? I'm blind. Look to Jesus and you have light. And then what do you do next? You take your first, next right step towards Jesus. One moment at a time. Lately for me, it's, I sit there and I say, Lord, what do you need me to do? And he says, get up walk into the kitchen and get a glass of water. Any of you on a day-to-day, moment-by-moment basis like that? Any of you walk into the kitchen, you're standing there and you say, uh, I can't even remember why I was in here, <laughs> right? Pray to the Lord, oh, glass of water, glass of water. I had one of those weeks this week. I trust me, I know what it's like. The spiritual battle is very real. And we got to take it one moment at a time. Don't even worry about tomorrow. Don't even worry about next week. You just worry about today. And in fact, lately for me, it's been don't even worry what happens after 12 o'clock. Because I was up since 4 o'clock dealing with phone calls. So right now, it's every hour. 
Keep your focus on Jesus on a very momentary basis. Amen? Now, I'm going to give you another secret. Secret number two. Okay, here we go. Secret number two. Why do you think, here's a question for you. This is the one I'm going to post to you. Why do you think Satan works in the shadows? Why do you think he works like a, like a stealth fighter? Okay, number one. Satan is constantly at work. I want you to know this. Satan does not sleep. He does not tire. He is constantly at work. He is subtle, and many have no idea of the activity that he's doing behind the scenes. Okay, number two. The people of God must be prepared to stand against Satan with our choices, our actions, and our words, because this is the way Satan likes to work. It's through choices, actions, and words. Okay, number three, we have a little delay here. I'm pressing the button, it's not moving, so I'm gonna ask my sound guys back there to press it for me. It is this very resistance that Satan dreads, okay? If you stand and you resist against Satan, Satan will flee. Okay, number four, go ahead and um, move it forward for me. Satan knows better than we do the limit of his very own power. Did you know that Satan is not all-powerful? Satan actually has limitations. Satan knows better than we do the limit of his own power. He knows how easily he can be overcome if we only resist and face him. Okay? Take a look at number five. Number five. Is it going? Okay, that just caught up. You're going to have to fix that projector. Let me turn around. <laughs> Through divine strength, the weakest saint is more than a match for Satan and all his angels. Okay, now think about this. Through God's divine strength, the very weakest saint. You all feeling like a saint today? Yeah? Everyone should be saying amen. I feel like a saint today, especially after communion. You should be praying that God comes today, okay? But we're still weak, right? In your weakest moment, if you have the divine strength of God, you are more than a match for Satan and his angels. Now, you take two of us together with that same faith, and we become a force. You take three or four of us. This is why God says two or three gathered together is strong. You cannot break the bind. In Ecclesiastes, it talks about that. Why? Because when you recognize the power of God and we are combined together, we are a strong force against Satan and his, his, um, his attacks. Now, in the next several weeks, I'm going to be talking about the armor of God. I'm going to talk about the weapons. And I'm going to actually illustrate for you an attack, but you're stronger when you're together. Okay, so you don't want to miss that because I'm actually bringing armor and I'm going to be like shooting darts at people, okay? So you want to see if they can protect each other appropriately. I hope that whoever I have up here is fast enough um, because I'm going to be shooting some pretty fast darts at the person, okay? Okay, how are we doing here? All right, thank you for working on that back there. Okay, number six. Because of this power, Satan works in the shadows. He moves with stealth, and his influences are masked. Satan will not risk to show himself openly unless he arouses the Christian's dormant energies, unless Satan arouses the spiritual gifts that we see in the uh, primitive church that's prophesied in the last days, and send him to God in prayer. Okay, the reason why Satan is working in stealth, the reason why you don't see his presence all the, all the time, is because Satan knows that he can be easily overcome when the saints are on their knees praying and we're armoring ourselves with the armor of God and utilizing the spiritual gifts to help the church grow and move forward to the second coming. Do you see this? That is real power. Now, I'm only mentioning this to you because many here are fearful of Satan. Because movies and television want you to believe that he is this grotesque-looking thing with horns, a a, um, a tail with a pitchfork and that he wants to bring you into an everlasting hellfire. As a matter of fact, Lucifer, Satan, is a great angel of light. He's going to be able to deceive many people. And he's going to work in the subtle to get you to get your focus off of Jesus. 
And Satan, all he has to, all, he knows that all we have to do is get on our knees, pray, and ask for the empowerment of God. And guess what? Satan, just like those demons that went into the swine, they're going to flee. But if you don't go with the power of God and you try to confront Satan and his minions on your own, you will be beat down, chewed up, spit out, digested, spit upon, and ground into ashes. You will lose that battle. And it's really, really more of a truth for God's people because we believe that we have the truth. We believe that we know everything in Scripture. And because of this arrogance that we think we know it all, we lose our sight of Jesus. We're looking at everything that I know. Look at everything that I have. Look at the history of my church. Look at all of the great things that these great pastors have preached. As soon as you start taking your focus off of Jesus and you focus on what you have and your history, you're doomed. This is why we daily walk with Christ, keeping our focus on him. Amen? Okay, we're going to move quickly now through this here. Okay. Still a disconnect. Okay. Okay. Satan's modes of attack. I talked about this last week. He'll use acute situations. Okay, these are moments where it just happens, like a broken water heater. Okay, um, I come home, I'm sloshing through water, wasn't planning that, boom. Now I have a financial problem. My kids don't have water. There's mold. There's all these bacterial things growing in, and I have to bring in all these you know, hazmat people to, to clean out my thing. That's, that's how Satan works. He wants to discourage us this way. And I told you what we did. We were just praising God. It's like, wow, praise the Lord. I finally get a new water heater. I didn't know I needed a new water heater. But th praise the Lord for that. Okay? He'll use circumstances. So we talked about um, the, the situations. Circumstances are these chronic situations that we all deal with. For example, our health. It could be things that we're dealing with from our marriages. Something that's been kind of long-lasting that we're giving to the Lord in prayer. You know, these are things, maybe it's our work, you know, people that we have to deal with that, you know, I can't even believe that person is my supervisor. You know, that person's a total, what's a good word that I can use as a pastor? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> total something, okay? I, sh I, sh I should be that person, right? These chronic situations, our health, things that we deal with, God, God wants us to be patient. He wants us to rely on him, but Satan uses these situations to scalp us. You remember the Indians, they scalp for trophies, okay? Now, last week I talked about love and lies. The Greeks had eight different ways of portraying love. Satan uses every single one of them, and he twists love in a way that becomes horrible, and it's a pathway to our destruction, okay? And it could be even things like self-love. I believe that today our kids and our young adults need more self-love, but not to the point of narcissism. You see how we can come too far, okay? Now, let's take a look at the last two there, attitudes and perceptions. This is another way that Satan attacks. Attitudes and perceptions are Satan's very best weapons, his very best tools. They're formed by how we take in and how we observe information through our eyes, through our ears, our nose, our tongue, our skin, and all of these things follow physics. We see through light. We hear through sound. We smell through pheromones. We taste through chemicals. We um, feel pleasure and, and things through the laws of thermodynamics and physics. All of these things can be deceived. Satan has control over how we see things, how we hear things, how we smell and how we touch, and we form memories. And all, because all these things can be deceived, Satan can use these to form our attitudes and perceptions. This is the only way that we form our choices, actions, and words. It's through our senses. Through our deceived senses, Satan can now lead us to the following reactions. We can um, form incomplete facts. Because we saw something, we heard something, but we didn't know the real situation. But because we have this incomplete fact, we now establish a feeling in ourselves. Oh, I hate that person for, for what they did, right? Or we establish um, and form a base of knowledge that we think we have. Oh, that person must think that she must know everything in the world. Or I can't believe that person was hitting that child the way they did. See, we're just taking things in through our ears and eyes, and Satan is forming conclusions and causing us to react in certain ways. 
All of these reactions, all of these conclusions, knowledge, feelings, perceptions, all formed because of what you had coming through your eyes and your ears, your nose, all of these senses form things that Satan can use. So because of that, God has some advice on the senses and how we form our attitudes and our perceptions. He said in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14, solid food is for the spiritually mature whose senses are trained by practice. You see that? So in other words, don't just take what you see, hear, smell, touch, and feel as the truth. Train it, okay, to distinguish between what is good and what is evil. Because Satan can use these ways too. So you have to base everything on that you perceive and sense through the word of God. This is your only sure way. So if you're angry at your spouse, if you're jealous, if you're forming all of these emotions, ask yourself, why do I feel this way? Because the feeling only established because of what you saw and heard and what you thought in your head. And maybe what you thought in your head is incorrect. The eye is the lamp of your body when your eye is clear or spiritually perceptive, focus on God. Your whole body also is full of light or benefiting from God's precepts. But when it is bad or spiritually blind, okay, so what you see when it's bad, your body also is full of darkness. Okay, you know that's true, right? So Jesus says, what is the definition of adultery? Is it when I actually have an affair with a married woman? Or is it when I have an emotional affair with another woman? Right, you know, that's real too. It's in the mind. Jesus said something else. He said, if you even look at a woman with lust, you've already committed adultery. Whoa, you mean to say that the sin of adultery started because of what I saw with my eye? Do you see what I'm saying? The eye is the pathway to evil, okay? The ears, the tongue, your actions, okay? All pathways to either moral goodness or moral evil. Well, I guess that's not moral. I guess that's fatal, okay? Evil. So, real quick, let me just go through this. This afternoon, we're going to look at 2 o'clock at discovering your spiritual gifts. When we come together, I'm going to be taking a look at some scriptures on how we can formulate our actions, our choices, and our words to help raise and re reinvigorate your dormant spiritual gifts. Okay, now many of you, only about 10 people, rose their hand. It's not going to be a long workshop. Come, I made some, some materials. I'm going to have it online. I'm going to broadcast it so you'll have the lecture so you can go back and reread it. But before we end, I want you to write these scriptures down, okay? These, um, this is a scripture on your thoughts and choices. I want you to ponder this between now and 2 o'clock. Mark chapter 7, verse 20 to 23. Mark chapter 7, verse 20 to 23. This is a direct scripture on how we formulate our choices, okay? I'm going to give you three now, okay? So there's your choices. Let's now look at your words. Remember, your choices, your words, and your actions is what determines your spiritual gift and whether they stay dormant or whether they come alive. You remember the prophecy, if you believe we're in the last days, the spiritual gifts are going to start to pour. I'm going to tell you something. The spiritual gifts are already here, but no one is using them yet. We're not ready for it. And I say it's time to wake up the church. It's time to make it happen. Okay? Primitive again. We got to go primitive. Okay, here are three verses. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 19. This is a scripture on words. Let me just say, in the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. You hear that? In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. That means those who talk too much, you're more bound to sin. Right? You say too much, you're going to say something and you're going to step over yourself and you're going to, I, I did that yesterday. Sorry for, for that, okay? Um, but he who restrains his lips is wise. Sometimes it's better just to shut up. Just be quiet, okay? Proverbs 10, 19. Okay, you said amen too loud back there, okay? <laughs> Proverbs 15, 4. 
Proverbs 15, 4, kind words heal, kind words help. You know that's true. Some people's language of love is words of affirmation. Oh, you look so beautiful today. Oh, praise the Lord. Thank you for singing and touching my heart. But cutting words, wound and maim. Proverbs 15, 4. You know the old saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never, what? Hurt me. That is absolutely false. I would much rather take the spanking from my dad. In my case, it was sticks, okay? Because I was a bad kid. My dad broke many pine sticks over my butt, okay? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but man, if I ever heard a bad word from my dad to me, that would stay with me for years. That actually has worse the words that we use is horrible. Okay, third one, Proverbs 21, verse 23. Proverbs 21, 23. Listen to this. This is in the Bible. Watch your words and hold your tongue, and you'll save yourself a lot of grief. Oh, sometimes we create grief for ourselves because of what we say. Okay, scriptures on actions. We're going to close out with these last ones here. Scriptures on actions. Proverbs 21, verse 25. Again, I'm giving these to you so you can contemplate on this for the, for the afternoon. Okay, Proverbs 21, verse 25. Now, I know there's some people who are going to say, man, Pastor Anderson, I hate you for saying this. This is why I'm telling it to you from Scripture. It's not me saying it. It's the Bible saying it. Okay, so if you're going to argue with me, don't argue with me. You argue with God. Are we agreed? Okay, Proverbs 21, 25. Lazy people will die of hunger because they won't get up and go to work. I didn't say it. The Bible said it. Okay? Faith. I have faith in God. But without your work and getting your resume together and throwing it out there and making some phone calls and going to the interview, is dead. Faith without works is dead. You got to do something. Okay? So that's Proverbs 21, 25. So in other words, you can pray to God with all you want, with a great righteous uh, faith. But boy, if you don't get up there and start taking that first right step and go into the kitchen and get that water and do the things, faith without your work is nothing. Okay, that's what it says, Proverbs 21, 25. Last one, James chapter 2, verse 18. Scripture on your action. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Okay, now listen to this. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. That's cool. Okay, that, that can only come from the Bible. Okay, that's one of those Chinese fortune cookie ones, man. Okay, okay, listen to that again. Someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Okay, okay, now, okay, listen, Chinese fortune cookie. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. That smackdown. That's, a, that's awesome. I love, I love scripture, man. Scripture. And that, I even read that to you from New King James Version. Okay, so that, that, that's just so plain. All right, final one. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4 through 6. And this is on the spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4 through 6. Now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit of God and, they, and there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. Okay, which means that you will have a gift that is needed in the service of God's people in the final days. Okay, do you believe it? Okay, I know this was a lot I gave you in a short little 20, 25 minute Come back at 2 o'clock, have potluck, don't leave. We have great food today. Um, we're in the spirit. We're on holy ground. We had an amazing communion. All feeling, you all feeling good? Come back at 2. We'll see you here, and we're going to talk about spiritual gifts. Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for giving us this lesson of perceptions, feelings, and emotions formed through our, our senses. Lord, help us to use these things for that which is morally good. Help us, Lord, to use our words, actions, and thoughts for righteousness, and help us to use these things to awaken our dormant spiritual gifts. Father, to this end, we pray for everyone here listening online and those of us here present. Thank you for this high Sabbath. In Jesus' name we pray this. 
Amen.